Hello everyone, this is Xiao Long. Um, I would like to talk about our work on learning long-term visual dynamics. So in this talk, we'll be focusing on the problem of visual prediction and use graph neural network to help with visual prediction. So in this problem, given it is usually given a sequence of past observations, and then we need to predict the future observations. The observation space can be many different things, including the pixels or the internal states of the agent. So why do we care about prediction? Here is a quote uh, from the book of the nature of explanation from Kenneth Craig. If an organism carries a model of external reality and its own possible actions within its head, it is able to react in a much fuller, safer, and more competent manner to emergencies which face it. So in human, we actually have an um, internal prediction model, and then we usually predict what the next steps will be, and then start interacting with the world. So inspired by this, um, a lot uh, in a lot of robotics application, model-based planning is widely used with a prediction model. By learning a deep network uh, to achieve the detection mode, uh, uh, to achieve the prediction model, it actually provides a differentiable way to adjust the inputs. So suppose we make an error in the prediction model, and if we want to achieve the goal, we can backpropagate the error in the deep network, and then use the gradients to change the action and the input in a very efficient way. Of course, um, prediction is also uh, provided as a task for visual representation learning in computer vision. So here is some examples of visual prediction in pixel space. The green box represents the input image and the red boxes represent the output images. So we can see that as it moves towards to the future, the output pixels becomes more and more blurry. Prediction in the pixel space is really difficult. Here is another example. The reason is that um, prediction in pixel space, the pixel is such a large space to predict, and as it tries to move forward to the future, the uncertainty will become larger and larger. Instead of predicting in the pixel space, in the intuitive physics community, researchers have been working on predicting um, directly on the state space. So given the state of the fluid, which is represented by a, different, a lot of small particles. Um, this work tried to perform interaction reasoning between these small particles and predict the future states of all the particles. So in here, they basically represent um, using the small particles to represent the fluid. But uh, when we apply this model in the real world, we cannot actually have direct access to the state representation. We are always observe uh, the world from the vision part. So it is very important to take in pixels as input for the model. But for planning, we actually do not really need um, pixels for the output. If we can pre predict the state of the objects, we can predict the trajectories of the objects, then it's already very useful for the purpose of planning. So we are arguing for the middle ground here, trying to bridge the two extremes together. We want to take in the pixels, but predict the future states and trajectories for the objects. So there are some um, progress in here, in, in intuitive physics, or also human and car trajectory prediction, given image as input. Another argument we want to make here is whether we should do short-term prediction or long-term prediction. It is difficult to make predictions, especially about the future, from the US form. So actually, making short-term prediction is very trivial for human. Predicting what the next step, what the next second um, the object will go, where, where the object will go, is actually very simple for human. The key challenge here is actually predicting long-term dynamics. So we argue that we should try to uh, study the model and try to model the long-term interaction instead of just one step of interaction. And previous methods try to get around this problem 
by just studying the short-term prediction um, by using model predictive control for planning. So in model predictive control, you will take action every step, and then you try to do planning by taking multiple actions um, at each time. So instead of just doing short-term prediction, we have seen some efforts on doing long-term prediction can actually help learning better planning. There are other works, um, there are other scenarios where long-term prediction can be very useful. For example, in this case, if we want to hit the white ball so that it can um, touch the, the other two balls, um, then in this case, we actually require long-term prediction because the action can be only applied in the initial stage. And then the white ball will just basically follow the physics law in the following stages. So there are no, there's no interference from the human to the system. Here is another example. So this is an environment, um, it's a fire environment from Facebook. So what it, what it asks for is where can we put this red ball so that the green ball can touch the, the blue ball here. So again, similarly, um, we can only take one initial action in this scenario is where to put the red ball and how large the red ball be. And then um, the rest of them will just follow the physics law. So if we want to achieve both goals, um, it's very important to have a long-term prediction model. And these two environments will also be our focus in this talk. So let's first take a look at what are the current status of object dynamic, dynamic prediction. There are already some works on try to learning predictions from the pixels in the intuitive physics community. Um, however, a lot of this method does not have an efficient or effective way to encode the object feature representation. For example, uh, in this both two works on predicting the block falling and also predicting the billiards of uh, the physics of the billiard, uh, it does not have the object feature representation that can encode the context information. And we hypothesis that is the reason that um, the, the representation limits that the model cannot predict very long-term interaction. And maybe learning a good representation for each object is the key to perform long-range prediction. We want to go through um, a, a, a sequence of related work on interaction language for video prediction. So the interaction network uh, is, um, is a kind of graph neural network. It is to um, first extract object-centric representation as graph nodes, and then perform interaction reasoning, basically relationship reasoning between the objects. And after this reasoning, um, the object updated feature for each object will be used for prediction. So in the visual interaction network, given an image, it takes in um, um, it, out, it, take, it was um, given as the input for a conflict, and then we extract the features for this image. We use multiple different channels to represent different objects. For example, if there were three objects here, then there will be three cross 128 channels to represent um, three different objects, and each 128 channel is representing one object. So this design is not very intuitive. And the model cannot really generalize to multiple different objects because um, the channel size is actually fixed in the convolution neural network. And this model cannot generalize to objects, uh, four objects or five objects. There are also a recent work on compositional video prediction, which takes an image and then crop um, every object out and then use these crop patches as input for the conflict, and then extract features for each patch, perform interaction reasoning among these patch features. In this work, the context information is not encoded in each um, object representation. There are also approach try to use masks, uh, where given one image, 
uh, if there are three objects there, it tries to mask out uh, every two objects and generate three different images. And then these three different images are used um, as input for the conflict three times. So we can see that this approach is very time consuming. So in our work, what we are trying to do here is trying to um, bridge the successful technique we already have in object detection and use it to help on the intuitive physics community. We are already very good at uh, object detection, instance segmentation, as well as the post estimation. But none of these techniques have been really applied in um, the intuitive physics world. So what we are trying to do here um, is try to use a region-based feature to encode the object states and the same context together. We find that by using these uh, techniques that is already very successful in object recognition in intuitive physics can help us to make this intuitive physics model generalize to the real world and perform interaction reasoning in the real world instead of just in the simulation. In this case, our model can even generalize to multiple different objects and more complex environments that is not seen during training time. And this enables us to do long-term prediction and planning as well. Our work here um, is done by Hao Zhi, Deepak Yi, and Jitendra. So um, our approach uh, pipeline is um, shown as here. So there are three main components. The first component is the visual encoder, which can extract object-centric representation for each object. Given the representation, we then perform interaction reasoning on top of these representations. And then given the updated representation after interaction, we use them to perform final prediction on um, the location of each object in the future. We would like to first talk about the visual encoder. So the goal of the visual encoder to, is to extract the object-centric representation for prediction. Suppose we have n objects, we will extract n different objects, features for each object, and then these features will be in time t will be used um, to predict the features in time t plus one. So we are performing prediction in the object representation space instead of the pixel space. Um, in more details, uh, we use our glass network to extract the image feature, and we used our align to extract the region proposal feature. So the region proposal here is uh, provided by the detection result. We first perform object detection in the image, and then we get the bounding boxes, and we use this bounding box as region proposal to extract the feature for each object. And final need, uh, we can have a fixed dimension output for each object. But instead of just using um, one single image to um, extract the object representation, we actually in here use uh, three different images, which we can use them to capture the dynamics of each single object. So um, what we do here is given OIT, which is the ith object, and in time t, we also concatenate this RI feature with um, the same object feature in previous time, t, t minus one and t minus two. We concatenate three features together and forward to a fully connected layer to obtain the XIT representation for the current object. So in this way, each object feature has already captured the dynamics of the movements of the objects. Given this object representation, we then forward to an interaction network module. So in this module, uh, it's trying to perform interaction reasoning and um, update the object feature after uh, making one step of interaction between all the other objects around. So given the example on the top right corner, if we want to predict the future movement of the blue billiard, what we want to encode here, there are three components. The first component is the self-dynamics. Uh, what we do is we forward the feature to a fully connected layer G to uh, extract the single dynamics feature. And the second part is the relation dynamics. 
where we need to consider the relation between the object, the blue object, and the red and the green object. To do so, we basically performed concatenation between every two objects. Uh, we concatenate the red object with the blue object and then forward to a fully connected layer edge to extract uh, a feature representation. And we do the same thing for um, both green object and the blue object. So in this case, we can see this is a relationship modeling between every two objects. Uh, we can see it by combining, concatenating these two objects together as the graph edge um, inside this interaction graph. So these two features are then summed together to represent the relation dynamics between uh, the blue object and all the other objects. We then combine these two information together um, to represent the final dynamics and the interaction results for the blue ball in one step. Given this updated feature for the blue ball, uh, we can then basically perform prediction. So in the prediction, model, um, we not only just use one step of updated feature, we also consider t time t to t minus k um, in the history of what the representation of the object is. We concatenate this interaction feature across time together and then forward to a fully connected layer to predict um, the future object representation in time plus one, t plus one. And then this feature can be used to predict the location, um, which is the output of the model. We apply our loss function as the outer distance between the predicted location and the ground truth location. And we apply this interaction module um, recurrently over time and on all different and, and different objects. So the loss is also uh, accumulated loss over time t. And during back propagation, we also back prop the error recurrently. So there are some technical details in training the network. For example, instead of just focusing on interactions between every two objects, we find that uh, in our experiment, uh, by performing interaction between nearby objects, it helps a lot uh, in generalization. This is um, because we don't need to, um, if there are a lot of objects, we don't want to uh, waste a lot of computation powered on objects that is far away. And then uh, maybe when they are far away, the interaction between them does not really affect the prediction that much. And then we also find that um, positional encoding is very useful as input for the objects. It helps us to generalize better to unseen environment and unseen number of objects in our generalization experiment. So uh, in our experiment, there are two main tasks. The first one is the prediction task. The second one is using the prediction model to perform, to perform planning. So uh, we use multiple data set. The first type of data set is simulated billiard environment, and as well as real billiard environment, which contains video download from, downloaded from the YouTube. And we also have shape stacks environment to compare with the compositional video prediction paper. And we also use the fire data set from Facebook, where we select seven environments from this data set and use six environments for training. Um, and then one out of distribution environment um, to just test for generalization. So in all these experiments um, for prediction, we basically use the L2 distance between the prediction and the ground truth location uh, as our metric. There are two types of metric we, might, we want to talk about here. So T chain here represents how many steps are used in unrolling the model in training time. So it is usually set as 20 steps. And during test time, we actually unroll the model uh, one times more. So basically to 40 steps. So we can see that um, in both cases, during 20 steps or 40 steps, um, we perform much better comparing to the baseline methods. And here is some result in the simulation billiard environment. 
we can see that our model can predict very complex interaction um, in this environment. And the trajectory results is also very close to the ground truth. So in this case, uh, we can see um, there are prediction and ground truth in the first two columns, and then a larger prediction and ground truth in the last two columns. Besides simulation, uh, our model can directly be trained on the real-world billiard environment. So these are some videos we downloaded from the YouTube videos. And we can see that our model can still work reasonably well comparing, comparing to the ground truth uh, in the real videos. And here is another example. Um, so one interesting thing is that uh, we can train one model on different viewpoints of the table because we use the ROI feature representation um, and that representation can capture the context information as well as the boundary of the table. So it actually can generalize to different viewpoints of the um, tables where previous method cannot. Finally, we also show results on the fire data set uh, where we can see how two balls interact with each other in prediction. So in this case, um, the environment is more complicated instead of just one table. We can see there are uh, multiple dogs in the environment. And in this case, modeling the context information becomes very, very important. And we can see, although our results is not exactly following the ground truth, but it is intuitively very similar. And here is more results. So, um, so besides just testing on in distribution environment, we also extend our prediction metric on unseen and novel environments. For example, uh, in the first column here, we evaluate on a um, model that is trained on three billiard balls to test on five billiard balls. And then we also extend our model on the second column to uh, unload the model to 60 steps instead of just 20 or 40 steps and see how the model performs. And in the fire data set, we also test our model on the leave one out environment, which is uh, one environment that is not existing in, in the training time. And we can see that um, we have much better generalization results compared to the previous method. Besides just doing prediction, we argue that one important factor we need to consider for the prediction model is actually to use it for planning. Um, so we propose three different planning tasks. The first task is to reach the goal um, position or configuration. So given this initial position, we want to apply an action on the blue ball so that it will reach the goal position. So the action here contains different angles, with how you pro provide the force, and then how much speed the initial ball should have. Considering all these different dimensions, we enumerate all the possibilities and use our prediction model to predict the future of the interaction. And then we select um, the most possible, the most, the least error way to apply the action as our final result. And here is another example that we need to hit um, the blue ball so that the two other balls will be moved after hitting. So we compute accuracy here. If the two balls are moved in eventually, then this is a successful uh, action. Otherwise, it's not a successful action. So in both cases, uh, we can see that um, our method is much better than the previous method. Especially in the hitting cases, uh, we have 70% of success rate, while other methods only have around 10% of success rate. The reason is that our model can um, model the interaction in the very long term, and you also consider the context information. Besides this, we also uh, uh, apply our model on the fire data set for planning, where we need to figure out where to put the the red ball and what size of the red ball should be 
so that the green ball would touch to the ground. So here is just one case. Um, there are also six other different environments we are considering for this um, data set. So in this case, in the last two columns, we show some results on the success rate. Basically, um, um, if the green ball eventually touched the blue bar or the blue um, blanket in the end. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you.